Perfect. Well, welcome everyone to our uh, new seminar for the One World uh, ABC. It's my pleasure today to have here uh, Pierre Alpier, um, who is a research scientist um, in the Approximate Bayesian Inference Team at the Center for Advanced Intelligence Project uh, at Riken in Japan. And he will be talking about concentration and robustness uh, of discrepancy phase. So th th thanks a lot for, for the invitation. So indeed, I, I'm going to talk about uh, um, like discrepancy-based ABC, but there is a very important part on robustness actually in this talk. So um, maybe, yes, I, I will start with a kind of general introduction when I, where I want to explain actually um, some ideas related to choices of uh, distance in uh, statistical estimation that might lead to robustness, and especially that will improve on some failures of uh, maximum likelihood in some situations. So that will be a kind of general introduction where I hope that I will motivate the use of some uh, adequate distance. And then uh, in the second part, that will be the, the longest part of the, of the talk, I will focus on Bayesian point of view and mostly on uh, the ABC uh, approach uh, that uh, is based on the joint uh, paper that will be ready in the next few days with Daniele Durante and Sirio Lagramanti. Uh, so I will introduce my co-authors actually just in a few minutes. Um, I will start with a very simple motivation, but that's really the reason why I, I, I was interested in working in this direction in the beginning. Uh, oh, that's sorry, that's the last slide. That's a little weird. Weird thing from my keyboard. <laughs> uh, it's not already finished yeah okay so um yes so just some simple notations i will use during the world talk so you have x1 to xn uh, iid from uh, distribution p naught and you have a model proposed by a statistician p theta uh, theta is a parameter and you might assume that p naught is actually some p theta naught so the truth is in the model of course we will remove this assumption as soon as possible because uh, very often we don't think it can be exactly the case and uh, what we want is uh, to propose an estimate of theta naught in this case uh, based on the sample uh, and uh, hoping that actually it will work regardless on assumptions on the model or on the truth that might not be too realistic and actually what i want to show is that in some examples the usual approach for example based on likelihood but when I say based on likelihood, I don't mean only uh, maximum likelihood estimation, but also uh, Bayesian inference uh, is based on the likelihood uh, also. So actually, it affects both. It might be, it might have some problems actually uh, when the model is not well specified and when you don't have uh, adequate assumptions on p naught. Uh, of course, like it's nice in exponential families, we can compute actually the, uh, the MLE explicitly, and we have nice guarantees in this case. But let me show actually a nasty counter example for MLE. Uh, that's something very simple, but just a density uh, with um, that is equal to infinity at zero. Okay, so here is just actually a gamma distribution. I just chose the parameters and then I symmetrized it. And uh, then actually the parameter I want to estimate is a translation parameter. Okay. But in this case, the problem is that the likelihood is infi infinite at theta. And so uh, if you draw a few observations from this model, which is super easy to, to estimate, by the way, you just use the, the empirical mean to estimate theta, it will work. But if you use the likelihood in this case, the likelihood would be infinite at each point of the uh, sample, which is not uh, nice and makes the MLE method not suitable. Um, something a little less uh, maybe, um, like this one, of course, is made up to make the uh, MLE fail. But uh, MLE is also not super robust in case of contamination. So for example, you all know like Huber contamination model. You assume that the model is actually almost the truth. So there is a P theta naught that generates most of the data. But with a small probability epsilon, then the data is sampled from uh, another probability distribution. That can be anything super heavy tail, super annoying, actually. And uh, like in a simple example, like uniform model, where you know that the MLE is the maximum of the sample, then actually if Q uh, produces sometimes a, a, an XI that is quite far from the upper bound theta, then the MLE uh, will, will fail. Okay, so I, it just has to be a Gaussian, but centered a little uh, above uh, the theta dot, and then actually MLE will fail uh, again. Okay, so 
among the possible proposals to, 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 to fix these problems, there was uh, like a very, I would say, old train of work that started in the 50s, where three people proposed First, to start from the empirical distribution, Pn at, so that's the like distribution or empirical distribution of the sample. And then you choose a metric that has to be, obviously, that has to induce some robustness. And then you minimize uh, the distance between P theta and Pn at uh, with respect to this metric. And actually, if you read some old papers, um, like for example, a very uh, famous paper paper by Pickle, Peter Bickle, actually on robustness in uh, 76. Then actually after the paper, there is a very nice discussion, short, but uh, super nice by Stuhorn, where uh, Stuhorn says, actually, uh, I think that we should use a minimum distance estimation. And if you use minimum distance estimation with cold model of distance, actually it should be more robust or something like that. Uh, so basically today I will focus uh, mostly on what we call integral probability metrics and integral probability semi-metrics. So the distance will be of the form uh, the supremum of the expectation of f of x uh, over all f in a given class, but I compare the expectation between uh, p and q. Okay, so if the expectation for all f is close, then actually I say that p is close from q, and if for some f the expectation is quite different, then I say that uh, p is far uh, from q. Okay. Um, I say semi-metrics actually because if the family F is not well chosen, this can actually sometimes be equal to zero even if P is different from Q. But we know many examples like total variation distance, for example, we come back to this example, where actually uh, this is exactly a metric, not a semi-metric. Okay, so a few assumptions required to ensure that it's a metric essentially, but we will work in this setting. Um, so, Actually, I will immediately provide a results uh, that I hope will also lead to some intuition for the Bayesian uh, setting later. If you have a, a x1 to xn sample from B0, and I don't have to assume that it is in the model. And if you work with a uh, integral probability metric uh, with a family F that is bounded, so that could be total variation, but actually functions F that are bounded by, by one, for example. Okay, then actually, the expected distance between uh, p theta at and p naught is the smallest possible in the model. So it's the best distance d of p between p theta and p naught plus a quantity here. So it's nice, sometimes we have a quantity, it's called actually the Rade macro complexity of the family F. We just have to analyze essentially this quantity. And if it goes to zero, I know that uh, minimum distance estimation, MDE will lead to a convergent estimator. Okay, so I get this quantity, it's a classical object actually in, in machine learning called the Rade macro complexity. So you take the sum here, one over n times the sum of uh, epsilon i, which is a random sign actually, called a Rade macro random variable, plus one or minus one with probability one half, times uh, f of y i. Okay, so obviously, um, if you consider this for a fixed f, uh, in expectation, it will be equal to zero. Okay, in expectation, it will be equal to zero. The problem is that here we will consider the supremum over a class F. And it might be that if the class F is rich, then in some sense, uh, for each epsilon i that would be plus one, we can make sure that F of y i is also large. And for each epsilon one that would be equal to minus one, we can take uh, F of y i that would be very small, the kind of inter inverse interpolation of the, of the data if you want. But then in this case, it would lead the Rade macro complexity to be very large. So in some sense, if the family F is super small, this should be close to zero. And the more the family F is large, the more uh, this here, uh, Rade macro complexity would be uh, large. So it leads to the intuition that for some family F, we should have a consistent estimator. And for some uh, family F, we should not have a consistent estimation. And it, it, it's actually the case. So I will provide an example immediately, two examples actually, um, based on the indicators. So the family F here that I will use to define the matrix will simply be zero one functions, okay? So I use this notation one A of X for uh, like one if X is in A and zero otherwise. And it appears that in this case, you can use a quantity known as the vatnik shervonenkis dimension of the family F. So the, the, the formal definition is written here. I don't want to go through this, uh, but I will instead comment on the uh, picture above. Actually, what is, it tells you is that you take any set of uh, endpoints, actually, um, 
And for, for this point, you assign all the possible uh, labels. So uh, each point is either plus or minus. And the question is, uh, can you find a set A that will contain exactly the plus and not the minus? Okay. So for example, if the set A is a half plane, for each configuration, each possible configuration of three points, you see here that you can separate them. But on the other hand, there is here a configuration of four points uh, and a choice of signs, plus or minus, so that actually it's not possible using a half plane to have on the same side of the half plane the one, the, the plus, the ones, and on the other side, the minus. So actually, what is called the Vapnik Shermanenki's dimension of the family of sets uh, A is actually the smallest, the size of the smallest set of points that you cannot shatter in any way you want, actually. And it appears that it is surprisingly enough, but it provides an exact measure of um, uh, whether your Rademacher complexity here will be finite, uh, or sorry, will converge to zero. And in, then actually whether you will have a consistent uh, minimum distance estimator. So actually an old result uh, is as follow actually by Bartlett and Mendelssohn that the Rademacher complexity of F can be bounded by square root of twice the Vapnik dimension times log N over N. So essentially, if the Vapnik dimension is finite, then the Rademacher complexity will go to zero. But you have also like a um, set of points. So that actually for each possible n, you can shatter all the points uh, in any way. And then actually, it means that in this case, you don't anymore have uh, a proof that the Rademacher complexity will go to, 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 to zero. OK. So uh, there are more recent, I, I should, I, I don't know why actually I chose the oldest result here, but there are more recent results where you can get rid of the log. But anyway. Essentially, if the Vapnik dimension is finite, then the Rademacher complexity will go to zero, which is the important message here. So just in talking about indicators, consider two possible family of sets. The first one will be all the measurable sets. So the sup, the sup over all the measurable sets uh, leads to actually the total variation distance. And the, oh, I don't know what's happened actually. There's a problem with my, sorry, with my keyboard. One of the, well, sorry. Okay, so in this case, the, um, the Vapnik the, the dimension is actually infinite, which means that for each possible set of points uh, that are plus and other that are minus, you can always find a measurable set that contains the plus, but not the minus. So actually it indeed appears that uh, in general, the Rademacher complexity does not tend to zero uh, when n tends to infinity. So Unless you think you modify, it's possible to use this for robust estimation, but you have to think a little more about the estimation procedure. It cannot be just a minimum distance estimation. On the other hand, the exact opposite, you take the Kolmogorov Smirnov distance between um, uh, the two distributions, which is actually just the sup between the um, CDFs, but it corresponds also to actually um, minimum distance, uh, sorry, to integral probability metrics with the set of indicators of just half line. And actually, um, given two points on the half line, uh, it's always possible to find, sorry, two points on the line, it's always possible to find a half line that contains one and not the other. But given three points, of course, it's not possible to find a half line that contains the two extreme points, but not the middle point. So it means that the Vatnik Shabonenki's dimension is two. Uh, I wrote one actually. Yeah, maybe there's a, it should be a two actually typo anyway. So in the end, you, you obtain the results here. Very nice that actually the KS distance between P theta at and P naught in these scales will, will be actually the best possible KL, uh, KS distance plus something that goes to zero in one over square root of M actually. So in this case, you see that actually we have a criterion. It tells you like if you have too many sets, too many indicators, uh, too many functions uh, when you define your IPS, then it does not lead to consistent estimation. But if you have a small set that is just right enough, then actually uh, you, you end up with consistent estimation. And I want to insist on another example that was mostly the motivation actually of what will come uh, in the uh, ABC part. It's uh, another example actually of integral probability metrics, which is called the maximum mean discrepancy. And it's inspired by uh, the kernel community. So actually you have a kernel so which means that actually it's a scalar product, but not between X and Y, but between phi of X and phi of Y, where actually phi is a possibly nonlinear function that maps the observation into a Hilbert space. And if you do so, it appears that um, um, 
well, when actually uh, the kernel is bounded, which is the case of many kernel we use in practice, like Gaussian kernel, etc., then the expectation of phi of x is well defined for any p. And moreover, there are kernels called characteristic uh, kernels, such that the map that maps uh, p into its expectation in the Hilbert space, the expectation of phi of x, is one to one. And it appears, so uh, I should mention this actually, but if you consider uh, it's proven, it's not easy, but it's proven uh, that uh, if you use, for example, the Gaussian kernel, then actually, of course, it's bounded by one, but it's also characteristic. So the expectation of each probability distribution is unique. Okay. And in this case, if you consider the, um, the MMD distance, so it can be defined, the usual definition is the Hilbert norm between uh, the expectation of phi of x under p and the expectation of the phi of f fx under q. But it appears that just rewriting uh, a norm as the sup uh, we, uh, um, of a scalar product with any vector of norm one, you can rewrite it actually as an integral probability matrix. Uh, so in this case, the set of function is the set of all function in the Hilbert space H whose norm is smaller than one. Okay, it appears that there is a classical result here uh, saying that the Radek macro complexity of this quantity is bounded if the kernel is bounded. Sounds weird because it's, it's a large space, it's a non parametric space, but still, its Radek macro complexity is bounded. And actually, you have exactly in the same way this result. So here, I don't have the log because when you use MMD, you can use a kind of, you can use alternative proofs to, 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 to prove this convergence. But essentially, here again, you estimate P0 with the, in the sense that you recover the best possible approximation of P0 in the model plus something that goes to zero. Okay, and this is described actually a refined proof that do not rely on Radek Markov complexity, but that is much, much simpler. Uh, is uh, in a paper uh, that we did with my PhD student, a former PhD student, Adredin Sharif Abdelatif. You have her photo of him when he visited me in Tokyo before the pandemic, actually. Uh, so explaining actually that MMD is a nice choice for robustness uh, in case of parametric estimation. So I have two very quick remarks. I can go fast on this maybe so that I can reach the Bayesian part. But uh, first important thing, um, the MMD, even though it's a little complicated, you can rewrite it actually as expectation from P theta, a function of expectations from P theta of the kernel and the sample. So I can come back later on this formula if you want, but what, what is important here and will be the first connection with uh, ABC actually, is that in order to approximate the MMD distance, all you need to do is to be able to sample from the model. You don't need assumption on the truth P0, but you need to be able to sample from the model. And this in the same way, you can actually approximate the gradient because the gradient is also an expectation under P theta. And so you can use stochastic gradient uh, methods to estimate uh, the uh, MMD. Okay, so I just will conclude this, this introduction actually on uh, the frequentist point of view. There were some, your, some work on this uh, using MMD actually to train uh, generative networks. So actually it works even for quite sophisticated model. There is an asymptotic study. Uh, we know that actually it can be asymptotically Gaussian under some assumptions. Um, and uh, another thing, one last thing I want to mention is that uh, another possible distance in the integral probability uh, symmetric family is the Wasserstein distance, which is recently extremely popular actually in many machine learning applications. So in this case, the set of function will be the set of Lipschitz function with Lipschitz constants smaller than one. And it appears that this one is super attractive because uh, Wasserstein has a lot of good properties that are uh, very popular currently actually. But uh, on the other hand, it's not easy to upper bound its Radek macro complexity. Uh, actually, in general, it will not go to zero. Uh, but it's possible to using other tools actually to control it. So I want to mention this paper by uh, Espen Danton, uh, Pierre Jacob, uh, Mathieu Gerbert, and Christian Robert, um, who actually studied uh, like estimation based on a Wasserstein distance. Um, so even though the general tool I proposed here might not work, it's still possible to use like other ways to understand uh, to understand Wasserstein distance in this context. Um, final very final remark uh, before I, 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 I reach the Bayesian part is that, sorry, I, I promised some robustness and actually I will do it. Um, like if you consider Uber's contamination model, so say you have a true parameter, theta naught, but actually a huge proportion of the observations come from the model, but you have a contamination queue. So using the definition of IPS, 
you can write it as a soup uh, of uh, you know like distribution of a x under p theta naught the distribution sorry between p theta naught and p naught so you can write it as a soup between the distribution of uh, f of x under p theta naught minus uh, the mixtures here of these two expectations and the fact is that if you just rearrange terms you see that this is proportional to epsilon times the distance between p theta naught and q but if as in the kolmogorov smirnov case, or as in the kernel case, the function in the class F are bounded. This, actually, the distance is always bounded by one. So actually, this is smaller than epsilon. So it's, an, I think, an important corollary of the result I presented before. Remember that p theta at uh, is close from p, t, p naught, the true distribution. In particular, if you are in the contamination model, you have two terms here between uh, in, uh, in, uh, bonding the distance between p theta at and p theta naught. One of them is the Rademacher complexity. So if you choose the family F well, it goes to zero. That's just up to you. But then you have epsilon, that is the level of contamination. So in some sense, if your level of contamination is small, then you still have a very good estimation of theta naught. And I will illustrate this on very small simulations. The simplest simulation you can imagine, I just took Gauche, uh, 100 observation from a Gaussian model with fixed variance, one, but I just want to estimate the mean, okay? Uh, and uh, I repeat the experience 200 times, and I re report the average uh, mean square error of three estimators, the MLE, the estimators, um, minimum distance estimator based on MMD, and the minimum distance estimator based on Kolmogorov distance. So you see that when the, the observations come from the model, as expected, the MLE is slightly better. We know that it is asymptotically efficient. It reaches the kramer rao bound, so we cannot really hope to improve on it. Now I just add 2% of observation from a Cauchy distribution. Just observe, like the one based on KS, it's okay, it's lucky, but even the third decimal does not change. MMD changes a little, but the MLE is terrible. And I did even worse, 1% of observation contaminated, but contaminated from a point that is the worst actually for the MLE, that is a point almost at infinity. And you see, like I took actually one, one observation is re replaced by 1000 then the mean squared error of the MLE becomes absolutely terrible, but you see that MMD and KS are still doing well. So of course, like you could do this also with the median. It's, it's an easy question, but what's nice with the minimum distance estimation approach is that you can apply it to estimate uh, expectation, but to estimate any kind of parameter, shape parameters, location parameters, scale parameter, and you always have this nice phenomenon of robustness. So, I don't know, I drink a lot of coffee actually today, so I don't know if I'm going too fast or, or not. So I will now uh, present the second part, uh, which is the more like related to this seminar uh, work on ABC. But maybe if you have questions first, uh, if I went too fast, don't hesitate to ask questions now because what comes uh, is actually based on what was done uh, before. So, um... okay, so otherwise I will carry on. So. I will start by a short advertisement, actually, because you have two possible ways. Uh, I mean, may, maybe more, but I'm aware of two possible ways to use uh, minimum distance estimation in a Bayesian framework. So a possible idea is actually something that's becoming very like popular recently, uh, mostly in machine learning, but I think in statistics also it's quite important now. And the idea is to replace uh, the posterior, which is like likelihood times essentially proportional to the likelihood times the prior by a kind of pseudo likelihood times the prior. And it turns out that uh, especially like a uh, pseudo likelihood, so you take exponential of minus a parameter times the risk function. And this approach is defended like in uh, famous papers like the one by Bissery, Holmes and Walker. They explain that actually, depending on whether you don't have a likelihood or the likelihood is not convenient or you don't trust your model completely or you are only interested in estimating some parts of the model, etc., you should actually use this approach. And, um, and indeed, so we proposed uh, first to do it. Uh, so I just wanted to mention the reference actually. So we studied uh, this kind of generalized Bayesian approach uh, again with my PhD student, Badreddin. And we have also a work in progress currently with Taku Matsubara uh, from Newcastle and uh, Jerry Knobloch from uh, University College London uh, to study the asymptotics of this, like Bernstein von Mises, et cetera. So it's not 100% ready, but hopefully like the preprint should be available in uh, a few weeks. Now, 
Finally, the um, introduction is over. I can reach the um, central part of the talk, ABC. So this part is based on a joint work with uh, Sirio Legramenti and Daniele Durante. And um, um, so here again, the paper is not completely finished, but I think it will be same. It should be like available on Archi on archive maybe within two or three weeks. Uh, and in this paper, we actually um, like motivated by the robustness, or especially of the MMD actually estimator in the beginning, we considered using it as a criterion for acceptation or rejection in the, in the uh, ABC algorithm. So I just have one slide to remind ABC, but I'm sorry, I'm, I hope I will not be uh, insulting anyone here because this is my first paper on ABC and you are all specialists of the topic. So I would say, okay, sorry, it's not introduction of ABC, it's more in order to fix notations, say. So still a sample, X1, Xn, model p theta, so I don't change this, but we have a prior pi. Uh, summary statistics, S, might be small or large dimensional, I have no prior on that for now. A distance delta and the threshold epsilon. And the ABC algorithm will be essentially like uh, each step you sample theta from uh, the prior. And then you sample Y1 uh, to Yn IID from P theta. And you compare the sample X1n, the true one, to the one you just sampled, uh, Y1n, uh, okay, through their statistics. And if they are close enough, you keep theta. Otherwise, you reject it and you start again. So you obviously all know this better than I do. But um, so actually, I just want to mention questions, at least for theoreticians that are um, uh, usually questions of interest, uh, like especially for example, is it possible to quantify how close the uh, output, uh, the, the distribution of the output of the algorithm is close to the true posterior. Uh, but um, also like uh, another way to think of this that I like is uh, essentially to consider, uh, you know, like to come back actually to this setting and to say, we can also think of approximate posteriors. Uh, generalized posteriors. So I can simply say that actually now this object is my object of interest because it's the one I know how to sample from. So it's a kind of pseudo posterior, but I still want to understand these asymptotic properties. Okay, so this would be my point of view, but now uh, I will discuss obviously the use of integral probability metrics uh, in actually uh, this algorithm. So I will write a new version of the algorithm. So it means that here essentially the statistics, the summary statistics will not be a summary. Like it is the empirical distribution of the data. And the distance that we will consider between uh, two empirical distribution will be uh, exactly as in the first part and uh, integral probability metrics. So in this case, the algorithm becomes, so you have your sample X uh, and then uh, at each step, you sample theta from the prior, you sample Y from your P theta. And then actually you, Compute. So you have the empirical distribution of X, the empirical distribution of Y, and you compare them through an integral probability matrix that you defined before. And if it's small enough, then you keep theta, otherwise you reject it. Okay, so it's a special case of what was uh, pr proposed before, but it's a special case um, that we hope actually will uh, have some uh, interesting features, especially in terms of uh, robustness. So just for notation, I hope this notation is not too heavy, but actually I will write as a pi at f n epsilon, <laughs> the distribution um, uh, the, out, the distribution of the uh, output of this algorithm. Okay, so hopefully this should be close to the posterior, but uh, as I want to understand the properties of this, I will denote it like that uh, actually. So if you, like, if you forget the notation later, just ask the question, it, uh, I will uh, remind it. So essentially, we decided to study three questions. First, uh, if epsilon goes to zero, does this go to the, it, does it become closer and closer to the original posterior, which is what is the initial motivation of ABC? Uh, also, what happens when n tends to infinity, but probably more interesting than the second one is also the case where actually, because in practice, you will never take epsilon um, equal to zero. Of course, you will take epsilon as small as possible to keep efficient computations. But when the sample size grows, uh, if epsilon was going to zero at a correct rate, uh, can you expect to have a kind of contraction of the posterior in the sense, uh, do, you do we have that this posterior will become closer and closer to a Dirac mass at theta naught if theta naught is the truth actually? Uh, so it appears that the third question is the one where we have a contribution essentially. 
Um, and the theory, uh, even though it's uh, not the same, but it will rely on, on some tools I presented before. So I will start with this question, actually. So the contraction of the ABC posterior. So first, in order to lighten notations, I will write uh, epsilon star as our objective in the sense that if the model is well specified, of course, I want that P theta converges to P theta naught, but if the model is not well specified, the best I can do probably is to recover the best approximation of the model. Okay, so the infimum of the distance between P theta and P naught, and this will be denoted by epsilon um, in the rest of the work. Okay. And in this case, it appears that under assumptions uh, that I will discuss in one minute, then you recover a contraction uh, rate that is a little ugly, but um, essentially, uh, I will spend some time on this slide to explain everything. So first, let us look at the result uh, before uh, the, before the uh, uh, assumptions. Essentially, the results say, so you have a theta which is drawn from our posterior with a threshold epsilon n that has to be chosen by the user. So if you draw theta from the posterior, so that is if you use your, um, uh, your ABC algorithm, because this is exactly the, the, the probability distribution of the theta provided by the algorithm. So if you use your algorithm, then the distance between P theta and P naught uh, with a probability that converges to one will be as small as the best possible distance between the two, Okay, between the truth and the model. So in particular, this is zero, of course, when uh, the model is correct. And otherwise, this is something that you cannot improve on anyway. And sorry, then what have... is a red? A red, a red of F, what is it? A red? Yes, so rad of N is exactly actually, um, I, 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 I'm going to comment on it immediately, but it's exactly the rad macro complexity that we had uh, here also. So it's, it is the Rade macro complexity of the family of your integral probability semi-matrix. The definition is here. And actually, the, like, just to remind what uh, the conclusion of the first part, depending on the semi-matrix you choose, this will tend to zero or not. But for example, if you choose the cold number of distance um, or the MMD distance, then this is in one over square root of N. So I'll come back to the slide here. So essentially, indeed, like, so, uh, sorry, I should have reminded the notation here, but you have this rather macro complexity. So it's this one is, it's, sorry, it's, it makes the rate here a little complicated, but actually this one will converge to zero or not. And the it will converge to zero essentially if you choose your uh, integral probability semi matrix well. So then actually you have this term in epsilon n and this term essentially, which is a square root of a log over n. It appears that actually, um, in order to make this work. So you can, what you have to do is to choose epsilon that goes to zero slightly faster than the Rade macro complexity of F. Uh, but on the other hand, not uh, too fast because n epsilon n must, must still tends to infinity. So if you make this choice here, then actually the probability that the distance between P theta naught, P naught is smaller than something that goes to zero actually will be larger than one. So it, it means that asymptotically, the posterior shrinks at a rate uh, to the best possible approximation of the truth in the model. And this rate is essentially given by the incompressible Rade macro complexity and your epsilon n. Okay, so now if I come back to the assumptions, indeed, in order for this to work, you have to assume that the Rade macro complexity goes to zero. But here again, we said it's not a feature of the unknown distribution of the data. It's not a unknown feature of the universe. It's just a feature of the distance you choose. So it's up to us to choose the right distance. In the same way, we have to use a family F with bounded functions, which was the case, for example, with Kolmogorov distance, with MMD, if the kernel is bounded, etc. And then the first hypothesis here is simply a prior mass condition. Uh, so it just tells you basically that the prior gives at least a little mass to a neighborhood of the best parameter. And it's exactly the same assumption that you have in any actually contraction of the posterior results, even in non-ABC world, you know, like the, you consider the true posterior. If this assumption is false, then you cannot prove that the true posterior con contracts to the best parameter. Um, so essentially under the one of the assumptions that makes the true posterior contracts to the best parameter, 
and on the true assumptions of the distance that you choose and not on the truth, only on the distance that you choose, then actually your uh, ABC uh, based on the discrepancy will produce a theta that is very close to uh, the best possible approximation of the truth, actually. Sorry, uh, perhaps a silly question. In the, in the first assumption, what is D in the exponent of epsilon to the power of D? So yes, actually the, 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 the thing, yeah, good, good question again, no, no, I should have, have said that. Um, you essentially, we could obtain various rates uh, inside here, the contraction, depending on the form of a, a function that which tells you how fast this goes to zero and epsilon goes to zero. It turns out that, for example, if your model uh, is for like um, in a dimensional, in a finite dimensional space of dimension D, this is usually what you would have uh, the rate here of epsilon would be proportional to the dimension. So it's essentially just think of a compact space uh, and actually a uniform prior, then the radius of a neighborhood of uh, any theta, when you let epsilon tend to zero, it's more or less uh, the, 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 sorry, the volume of the ball goes to zero in epsilon to the D. So the D comes from there, but actually it means that in the end, in the rate of convergence here that you have, uh, the dimension, of course, uh, appears. So this is why it's called, uh, I call this parameter, it's, it's a dimension. So as an application, maybe, so that I can write a simpler, I, I admit that this maybe is a little heavy, it's the more, the most possible general result. On the other hand, I hope that the simple, the take home message is clear. You have two assumptions, one on the choice of the prior, one on the choice of the metric. You have no assumption on the truth. P0 can be everything. P0 can have super heavy tails. P0 can be discrete or continuous. Uh, it's not a problem. You will still, uh, if the truth is in the model, recover it, or if it's not in the model, target its best approximation. Okay. And um, historically, there, there were examples. I mean, we did not invent uh, discrepancy based ABC, of course, like there were uh, papers on this topic. Uh, before, and I will cite some of them here. The others are, are more as cited in the paper. But for example, there were a, a paper by um, Park, G. Pritum, and Seydinovich, where they used, it's not exactly the same, but it's uh, just a very small variant of the algorithm we proposed based on MMB. Uh, so actually, if you use the algorithm I described previously with the MMB distance, uh, if the kernel is bonded, we already know, actually, I mentioned this in the first part, that this assumption is always true. If you use MMD, the Rademacher complexity goes to zero, and if the kernel is bounded, then actually the functions are bounded by one in your integral probability matrix. So in this case, it means that you only need the prior mass condition. And then if you choose epsilon, which would be any rate between one over n and one over square root of n, you see that actually your posterior will actually uh, draw parameters that are at the optimal distance of the truth plus something in epsilon n. And here, the part due to the Rademacher complexity is essentially in one over square root of n. So you see that essentially what you would like to do when I say epsilon n must be somewhere in between one over n and one over square root of n, you want to take it as small as possible. Maybe you can take it in kind of one over n, for example. You cannot do exactly it, but it can be like log of n over n. But still, the leading term here in the convergence will be this one, one over square root of n. And it means it's a strong result. It means once again, like independently of the truth, your posterior will contract to the parameter that is the best approximation of the truth. Uh, now, there is a question that is, I think, important. Um, yeah. The, the, the question is, uh, what happens if you don't have the Rademacher complexity going to zero? So what happens if you want to use the total variation distance? Or what happens if you want to use maybe the Wasserstein distance? And the answer is that actually it still can work, but essentially you will not be able to prove something like that in the sense that you will not be able to prove a result that does not depend on the truth. Uh, I will provide a very convincing example, I hope, that actually if you remove the assumption that the Rademacher complexity goes to zero, then obviously it will happen well for some distribution and less well for other distributions. But I just will state the equivalent result first. 
So essentially, if you don't have the Rade macro complexity, what you have to do is essentially to check by hand rather than by relying on heavy theoretical tools. You have to prove by hand that if you sample y from p theta, then the distance between the empirical distribution of y and p theta will actually co contract to zero. And it's not always the case. It's not always the case. Like, for example, if you sample uh, y i's from a Gaussian distribution, and here you consider the total variation distance, it will always be one because the total variation distance between a discrete empirical distribution and the continuous Gaussian distribution is always one. So if your distance does a, bit, a little better than that and you have the contraction here, uh, then actually you can still recover a contraction result, but you see that the rate, instead of being in one over N, it's no longer explicit and it will depend on how well you're able to prove the contraction of P and Y to P theta. So in this case, it's still possible to do things, but it depends on how well you can proceed this. And obviously, actually, it cannot always work for all thetas. So I will provide maybe an example. Uh, remember that I said before, if you use the MMD distance with a bounded kernel by one, then actually you estimate the truth without assumptions. Now, just choose an unbounded kernel. And it appears that the concentration that we had here it's quite possible to use it because uh, what's nice with the MMD distance is that essentially it's, it's a distance in a Hilbert space. So for example, if you square it, it's quite easy to compute the expectation. And simply using something like um, Chebyshev's inequality, you know, probability control of the fact uh, that you move uh, from your expectation, which is upper bounded by the variance, for example, you can simply control essentially the, um, like the, the quantity in the assumption of the previous theorem. And in this case, the result, so you don't have to check the rate explicitly, but like what is important is to see that if you don't have a bounded kernel, you don't have a bounded Rade uh, macro complexity that goes to zero. And indeed, in practice, the price to pay is that, of course, what you do will only work if your model contains probability distribution such that the kernel of Z, Z, when Z is drawn from the distribution is finite. And you also have to assume that this is true for the truth P0. It, it seems in some sense uh, obvious, okay? If you have a bounded kernel, then the bond, then actually the expectation of K of ZZ is bounded for all the distributions. Now, actually, if you use an unbounded kernel in the MMD distance, then the probability distribution such that the expectation of K of ZZ is infinite will correspond to probability distributions in, uh, 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 that have actually an infinite MMD distance. And then it becomes difficult to say anything about these. And so in the end, what you recover, and you still have contraction of the posterior, but the rate is, uh, I mean, the convergence only takes place for these distributions. So in terms, it might still be good. It might even, in some cases, be better actually than unbounded kernel but you lose the absolute robustness in the sense that there is some P0, there is some true distribution that will make you fail. Um, okay, maybe I was a little too slow. So I, I can skip a few results actually, but I just want to mention this. Um, actually this paper, um, I will send uh, like a message to, uh, actually I know that, um, uh, at least I think that Mathieu was online in the beginning of the talk, so I say hello also to, 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 to Mathieu. But like this paper was uh, actually, so ABC with Wasserstein distance. Uh, this paper was, um, of course, very influential uh, in our uh, own study. Actually, in some sense, some parts of our proof, we use uh, some parts of their proof for Wasserstein, but well, actually, in, when they deal with Wasserstein, then we remove it and we start to consider MMD or other distances. And it leads to, in some cases, complications or simplifications. But essentially, like, of course, it was super influential to, 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 to us. What I want to say is that uh, they have actually uh, an application uh, of, like this result, essentially, like the result where you don't have a uh, Rademacher, because once again, for Wasserstein distance, you don't have Rademacher complexities that goes to zero. So they, they actually also check this assumption here on some cases. And the take home message is that uh, it works in some cases, but it's not always possible. 
So uh, these bonds uh, impose some restrictive assumption. For example, uh, like a bond like that is provided in the paper by Wiedenbach, and it requires that actually the observation is in a bounded space. So you obtain something that is very interesting in some setting, but that will Im imply a small loss in generality, actually. OK. Uh, I just want to, so sorry, I will skip this because I don't want to talk during uh, three hours and anyway, you will start to disconnect soon if I do so. So uh, I just want to mention that the when n tends to infinity for a fixed epsilon, uh, essentially we did not have to prove anything. We just checked that the assumptions of existing papers allow to understand actually in this case what the distribution becomes. And in the same way, um, when n is fixed, but epsilon tends to zero, following a tool, tools once again from the paper by Danton, Jacob, uh, Gerber, and Christian Robert, then actually we were able to prove that you recover the true distribution under quite minimal assumptions. So in, in this case, uh, I just mentioned this in the slide actually, but the results were already existing and we just had to like recover our, like these results as kind of uh, special, uh, special cases. We have some simulations here again, uh, showing like posteriors of um, MMD ABC or Wasserstein ABC or KLR ABC. Here again in a Gaussian experiment with, uh, when you go to the right, you have larger and larger levels of contamination. And essentially, when you compare to uh, KL or to Wasserstein, um, when the distribution, the contamination has heavy tails, actually, you, we still observe that this, uh, for example, MMD with bonded kernels uh, has very nice robustness uh, properties. Uh, I just want, of course, like I could not cite all the works uh, that help actually to develop these results. I want to cite a few, just two or three results uh, before I end the talk. Um, like um, other related work, like especially like this nice paper by David Fraser, where he actually consider F divergences. And you see that here we have some actually like the KL or gamma divergences in our experiments. So that have also like nice robustness properties in some settings. Uh, or the paper by Nguyen, uh, Jean Arbel, and Forbes uh, on um, energy statistics, uh, um, et cetera. Um, so more papers are, are discussed in the paper that will appear soon and uh, like on archive. And sorry if I don't cite them during the talk. Uh, also, I want to advertise for uh, some works, other works we're doing currently on, uh, on MMD, and especially, sorry, like, we have other papers uh, with um, Jean-David Fermagnon and Alexis de Rumini on applying uh, the frequentist version to copula estimation, which is a work that is going to appear soon in JASA, actually. Uh, and with Mathieu, we, have, uh, we are currently working, actually, on the revision of a paper uh, for regression. It appears that uh, all this theory is quite simple for parametric models, but for semi-parametric models. So that is, for example, in regression, you want to specify the distribution of Y given X, but not the distribution of X. Then suddenly, in this case, it's not so obvious. You have to do something to avoid to have to estimate the distribution of X. And it appears that in the case of regression, Mathieu will probably be able to confirm what I say, but it's suddenly very painful uh, in terms of theory. So um, that's, uh, I think, another interesting direction. Uh, so sorry, I just wanted to do this uh, um, additional advertisement, and uh, this is the end in uh, in Japanese. Thank you for your uh, attention and for the invitation. Uh, thank you, thank you a lot, Pierre, for such a very interesting uh, talk. And the visual clapping. Um, I stop. Uh,